Chapter number seven of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski, John K. Thomas. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandis. Chapter seven Big Men and Little Business. J.P. Morgan and Co. declare in a letter to the Pujo Committee, that practically all the railroad and industrial development of this country has taken place initially through the medium of the great banking houses. That statement is entirely unfounded, in fact. On the contrary, nearly every such contribution to our comfort and prosperity was initiated without their aid. The great banking houses came into relation with these enterprises either after successes had been attained or upon reorganization after the possibility of success had been demonstrated. But the funds of the hardy pioneers who had risked their all were exhausted. This is true of our early railroads, of our early street railways, and of the automobile, of the telegraph and the wireless, of gas and oil, of harvesting machinery, and of our steel industry, of textile, paper, and shoe industries, and of nearly every other important branch of manufacture. The initiation of each of these enterprises may properly be categorized as great transactions, and the men who contributed the financial aid and business management necessary for their introduction are entitled to share equally with inventors in our gratitude for what has been accomplished but the instances are extremely rare where the original financing of such enterprises was undertaken by investment bankers great or small it was usually done by some common businessman accustomed to taking risks or by some well-to-do friend of the inventor or pioneer who was influenced largely by considerations other than money getting here and there you will find that banker aid was given, but usually, in those cases, it was a small local banking concern, not a great banking house, which helped to initiate the undertaking. Railroads. We have come to associate the great bankers with railroads, but their part was not conspicuous in the early history of the eastern railroads, and in the Middle West the experience was, to some extent, similar. The Boston and Maine Railroad owns and leases 2,215 miles of the line, but it is a composite of about 166 separate railroad companies. The New Haven Railroad owns and leases 1,996 miles of the line, but it is a composite of 112 separate railroad companies. The necessary capital to build these little roads was gathered together partly through state, county, or municipal aid, partly from businessmen or landholders who sought to advance their special interests, partly from inventors, and partly from well-to-do, public-spirited men who wished to promote the welfare of their particular communities. About seventy-five years after the first of these railroads was built, J.P. Morgan & Co. became fiscal agent for all of them by creating the new Haven, Boston, and Maine monopoly. Steamships The history of our steamships lines is similar. In 1807, Robert Fulton, with the financial aid of Robert R. Livingston, a judge and statesman, not a banker, demonstrated with the Claremont that it was practicable to propel boats by stream. In 1833, the three Cunard brothers of Halifax and 232 other persons, stockholders of the Quebec and Halifax Steam Navigation Company, joined in supplying about $80,000 to build the Royal William, the first steamer to cross the Atlantic. In 1902, many years after individual enterprises had developed practically all the great ocean lines j p morgan and co floated the international mercantile marine with its fifty two million seven hundred forty four thousand dollars of four and a half bonds now selling at sixty and a hundred million dollars of stock preferred and common on which no dividend has ever been paid 
it was just sixty-two years after the first regular line of transatlantic steamers the cunard was founded that mr morgan organized the shipping trust telegraph the story of the telegraph is similar the money for developing morse's invention was supplied by his partner and co-worker alfred vale the initial line from washington to baltimore was built with an appropriation of thirty thousand made by congress in eighteen forty three sixty six years later j p morgan and co became bankers for the western union to financing his purchase by the american telephone and telegraph company harvesting machinery next to railroads and steamships harvesting machinery has probably been the most potent factor in the development of america and most important of the harvesting machines was cyrus h mccormick's reaper that made it possible to increase the grain harvest twenty or thirty fold no investment banker had any part in introducing this great business man's invention mccormick was without means but william butler ogden a railroad builder ex-mayor and leading citizen of chicago supplied twenty five thousand dollars with which the first factory was built there in eighteen forty seven forty five years later j p morgan and co performed the service of combining the five great harvester companies and receiving a commission of three million dollars the concerns then consolidated as the international harvester company with a capital stock of a hundred and twenty million dollars had despite their huge assets and earning power been previously capitalized in the aggregate at only ten million five hundred thousand dollars strong evidence that in all the preceding years no investment banker had financed them indeed mccormick was as able in business as in mechanical invention two years after ogden paid him twenty five thousand dollars for a half interest in the business mccormick bought it back for fifty thousand dollars and thereafter until his death in 1884 no one but members of the mccormick family had any interest in the business the banker era it may be urged that railroads and steamships the telegraph and harvesting machinery were introduced before the accumulation of investment capital had developed the investment banker and before america's great banking houses had been established and that consequently it would be fair to inquire what services bankers had rendered in connection with later industrial development the firm of j p morgan and co is fifty five years old kuhn loeb and co fifty six years old lee higginson and co over fifty years and kidder peabody and co forty eight years and yet the investment banker seems to have had almost as little part in initiating the great improvements of the last half century as did bankers in the earlier period steel the modern steel industry of america is forty-five years old the great bankers had no part in initiating it andrew carnegie then already a man of large means introduced the bessemer process in eighteen sixty eight in the next thirty years our steel and iron industry increased greatly by eighteen ninety eight we had far outstripped all competitors america's production about equaled the aggregate of england and germany we had also reduced costs so much that europe talked of the american peril it was eighteen ninety eight when j p morgan and co took their first step in forming the steel trust by organizing the federal steel company then followed the combination of the two mills into an eighty million dollar corporation j p morgan and co taking for their syndicate services twenty million dollars of common stock about the same time the consolidation of the bridge and structural works the tin plate the sheet steel the hoop and other mills followed and finally in nineteen o one the steel trust was formed with a capitalization of one billion 
$402 million. These combinations came 30 years after the steel industry had been initiated. The telephone. The telephone industry is less than 40 years old. It is probably America's greatest contribution to industrial development. The bankers had no part in initiating it. The glory belongs to a simple, enthusiastic, warm-hearted businessman of Haverhill, Massachusetts, who was willing to risk his own money. H. N. Casson tells of this most interestingly in his History of the Telephone. The man who had money and dared to stake it on the future of the telephone was Thomas Sanders, and he did this not mainly for business reasons. Both he and Hubbard were attached to Bell primarily by sentiment, as Bell had removed the blight of dumbness from Sanders' little son and was soon to marry Hubbard's daughter. Also, Sanders had no expectation at first that so much money would be needed. He was not rich. His entire business, which was that of cutting out soles for shoe manufacturers, was not at any time worth more than $35,000. Yet, from 1874 to 1878, he had advanced nine-tenths of the money that was spent on the telephone. The first 5,000 telephones and more were made with his money. And so many long, expensive months dragged by before any relief came to Sanders, that he was compelled, much against his will and his business judgment, to stretch his credit within an inch of the breaking point to help Bell and the telephone. Desperately, he signed note after note until he faced a total of $110,000. If the new scientific toy succeeded, which he often doubted, he would be the richest citizen in Haverville, and if it failed, which he sorely feared, he would be a bankrupt. Sanders and Hubbard were leasing telephones two by two to businessmen who previously had been using the private lines of the Western Union Telegraph Company. This great corporation was, at this time, their natural and inevitable enemy. It had swallowed most of its competitors and was reaching out to monopolize all methods of communication by wire. The rosiest hope that shone in front of Sanders and Hubbard was that the Union, the Western Union, might conclude to buy the Bell patents, just as it had already bought many others. In one moment of discouragement, they had offered the telephone to President Orton of the Western Union for $100,000, and Orton had refused it. What use, he said pleasantly, could this company make of an electrical toy? But besides the operation of its own wires, the Western Union was supplying customers with various kinds of printing telegraphs and dial telegraphs, some of which could transmit 60 words a minute. These accurate instruments, it believed, could never be displaced by such a scientific oddity as the telephone, and it continued to believe this until... One of its subsidiary companies, the Gold and Stock, reported that several of its machines had been superseded by telephones. At once, the Western Union awoke from its indifference. Even this tiny nibbling at its business must be stopped. It took action quickly and organized the American Speaking Telephone Company, and with $300,000 capital, and with three electrical inventors, Edison, Gray, and Dolbeer, on its staff. With all the bulk of its great wealth and prestige, it swept down upon Bell and his little bodyguard. It trampled upon Bell's patent with as little concern as an elephant can have when he tramples upon an ant's nest. To the complete bewilderment of Bell, it coolly announced that it had the only original telephone and that it was ready to supply superior telephones with all the latest improvements made by the original inventors, Dolbeer, Gray, and Edison. The result was strange and unexpected. The Bell Group, instead of being driven from the field, were at once lifted to a higher level in the business world, and the Western Union, in the endeavor to protect its private lines, became involuntarily a bellwether, 
to lead capitalists in the direction of the telephone. Even then, when financial aid came to the Bell Enterprise, it was from capitalists, not from bankers. And among these capitalists was William H. Forbes, son of the builder of the Burlington, who became the first president of the Bell Telephone Company. That was in 1878. More than 20 years later, after the telephone had spread over the world, the great house of Morgan came into financial control of the property. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company was formed. The process of combination became active. Since January 1900, its stock has increased from 25,886,300 to 344,606,400 in six years. 1906 to 1912, the Morgan Associates marketed about $300 million bonds of that company or its subsidiaries. In that period, the volume of business done by the telephone companies had, of course, grown greatly, and the plant had to be constantly increased. But the proceeds of these huge security issues were used, to a large extent, in affecting combinations, that is, in buying out telephone competitors, in buying control of the Western Union Telegraph Company, and in buying up outstanding stock interests in semi-independent bell companies. It is these combinations which have led to the investigation of the telephone company by the Department of Justice, and they are, in large part, responsible for the movement to have the government take over the telephone business. Electrical Machinery the business of manufacturing electrical machinery and apparatus is only a little over 30 years old. J.P. Morgan & Co. became interested early in one branch of it, but their dominance of the business today is due not to their initiating it, but to their effecting a combination and organizing the General Electric Company in 1892. There were then three large electrical companies, the Thompson Houston, the Edison, and the Westinghouse, besides some small ones. The Thompson Houston of Lynn, Massachusetts, was in many respects the leader, having been formed to introduce, among other things, important inventions of Professor Elihu Thompson and Professor Houston. Lynn is one of the principal shoe manufacturing centers of America. It is within 10 miles of State Street, Boston, but Thompson's early financial support came not from Boston bankers, but mainly from Lynn businessmen and investors, men active, energetic, and used to taking risks with their own money. Prominent among them was Charles A. Coffin, a shoe manufacturer, who became connected with the Thompson Houston Company upon his organization and president of the General Electric, when Mr. Morgan formed that company in 1892 by combining the Thompson, Houston, and the Edison. To his continued service, supported by other Thompson Houston men in high positions, the great prosperity of the company is, in large part, due. The two companies, so combined, controlled probably one-half of all electrical patents then existing in America, and certainly more than half of those which had any considerable value. In 1896, the General Electric pooled its patents with the Westinghouse, and thus competition was further restricted. In 1903, the General Electric absorbed the Stanley Electric Company, its other large competitor, and became the largest manufacturer of electric apparatus and machinery in the world. In 1912, the resources of the company were 131,942,144. It billed sales to the amount of 89,182,184.
it employed directly over 60,000 persons, more than a fourth as many as the Steel Trust, and it is protected against undue competition, for one of the Morgan partners has been a director since 1909 in the Westinghouse, the only other large electrical machinery company in America. The Automobile the automobile industry is about 20 years old. It is now America's most prosperous business. When Henry B. Joy, president of the Packard Motor Car Company, was asked to what extent the bankers aided in initiating the automobile, he replied, It is the observable facts of history. It is also my experience of 30 years as a businessman, banker, etc. At first the seer conceives an opportunity, he has faith in his almost second sight. He believes he can do something, develop a business, construct an industry, build a railroad, or Niagara Falls Power Company, and make it pay. Now, the human measure is not the actual physical construction, but the make it pay. A man raised the money in the late 90s and built a beet sugar factory in Michigan. Wiseacres said it was nonsense. He gathered together the money from his friends who would take a chance with him. He not only built the sugar factory, and there was never any doubt of his ability to do that, but he made it pay. The next year, two more sugar factories were built and were financially successful. These were built by private individuals of wealth, taking chances in the face of cries of doubting bankers and trust companies. Once demonstrated that the industry was a sound one financially, and then bankers and trust companies would lend the new sugar companies, which were speedily organized a large part of the necessary funds to construct and operate. The motor car business was the same. When a few gentlemen followed me in my vision of the possibilities of the business, the banks and older businessmen, who in the main were the banks, said, fools and their money soon be parted, etc., etc. Private capital at first establishes an industry, backs it through its troubles, and, if possible, wins financial success when banks would not lend a dollar of aid. The business once having proved to be practical and financially successful, then do the banks lend aid to its needs. Such also was the experience of the greatest of the many financial successes in the automobile industry, the Ford Motor Company. How Bankers Arrest Development But great banking houses have not merely failed to initiate industrial development. They have definitely arrested development because to them the creation of the trusts is largely due. The recital in the memorial address to the president by the Investors Guild in November 1911 is significant. It is a well-known fact that modern trade combinations tend strongly toward constancy of process and products, and by their very nature are opposed to new processes and new products originated by independent inventors and hence tend to restrain competition in the development and sale of patents and patent rights, and consequently tend to discourage independent inventive thought to the great detriment of the nation, and with injustice to inventors whom the Constitution especially intended to encourage and protect in their rights. And more specific was the testimony of the engineering news, we are today something like five years behind Germany in iron and steel metallurgy, and such innovations as are being introduced by our iron and steel manufacturers are most of them merely following the lead set by foreigners years ago. We do not believe this is because American engineers are, le are any less ingenious or original than those of Europe, though they may indeed be deficient in training and scientific education compared with those of Germany. We believe the main cause is the wholesale consolidation which has taken place in American industry. A huge organization 
is too clumsy to take up the development of an original idea. With a market closely controlled and profits certain by following standard methods, those who control our trusts do not want the bother of developing anything new. We instance metallurgy only by way of illustration. There are plenty of other fields of industry where exactly the same condition exists. We are building the same machines and using the same methods as a dozen years ago, and the real advances in the art are being made by European inventors and manufacturers, to which President Wilson's statement may be added. I am not saying that all invention had been stopped by the growth of trusts, but I think it is perfectly clear that invention in many fields has been discouraged, that inventors have been prevented from reaping the full fruits of their ingenuity and industry, and that mankind has been deprived of many comforts and conveniences, as well as the opportunity of buying at lower prices. Do you know, have you had occasion to learn, that there is no hospitality for invention nowadays? Trusts and financial concentration. The fact that industrial monopolies arrest development is more serious even than the direct burden imposed through extortionate prices. But the most harm-bearing instance of the trusts is their promotion of financial concentration. Industrial trusts feed the money trust. Practically every trust created has destroyed the financial independence of some communities and of many properties, for it has centered the financing of a large part of whole lines of business in New York, and this usually with one of a few banking houses. This is well illustrated by the Steel Trust, which is a trust of trusts. That is, the Steel Trust combines in one huge holding company the trust previously formed in the different branches of the steel business. Thus, the Tube Trust combines 17 tube mills, located in 16 different cities, scattered over five states, and owned by 13 different companies. The Wire Trust combined 19 mills, the Sheet Steel Trust 26, the Bridge and Structural Trust 27, and the Tin Plate Trust 36, all scattered similarly over many states. Finally, these and other companies were formed into the United States Steel Corporation, combining 228 companies in all. Located in 127 cities and towns scattered over 18 states, before the combinations were affected, nearly every one of these companies was owned largely by those who managed it, and had been financed to a large extent in the place or in the state in which it was located. When the Steel Trust was formed, all these concerns came under one management. Thereafter, the financing of each of these 228 corporations, and some which were later acquired, had to be done through or with the consent of J.P. Morgan Co. That was the greatest step in financial concentration ever taken. Stock Exchange Incidents the organization of trusts has served in another way to increase the power of the money trust. Few of the independent concerns out of which the trusts have been formed were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and few of them had financial offices in New York. Promoters of large corporations whose stock is to be held by the public and also investors desire to have their securities listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Under the rules of the exchange, no security can be so listed unless the corporation has a transfer agent and registrar in New York City. Furthermore, banker directorships have contributed largely to the establishment of the financial offices of the trusts in New York City. That alone would tend to financial concentration, but the listing of the stock enhances the power of the money trust in another way. An industrial stock, once listed, frequently becomes the subject of active speculation, and speculation feeds the money trust indirectly in many ways. It draws the money of the country to New York. The New York bankers handle the loans of other people's money on the stock exchange, and members of the stock exchange receive large amounts from commissions. For instance, 
there are 5,084,952 shares of United States steel common stock outstanding. But in the five years ending December 31st, 1912, speculation in that stock was so extensive that there were sold on the exchange an average of 29,380,888 shares a year, or nearly six times as much as there is steel common in existence. Except where the transactions are by or for the broker's sales on the exchange involve the payment of 25 cents in commission for each share of stock sold. That is, 12 and one half cents by the seller and 12 and one half cents by the buyer. Thus the commission from the steel common alone afforded a revenue averaging many millions a year. The steel preferred stock is also much traded in, and there are 138 other industrials, largely trusts, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Trust Ramifications But the potency of trusts as a factor in financial concentration is manifested in still other ways, notably through their ramifying operations. This is illustrated forcibly by the General Electric Company's control of water power companies, which has now been disclosed in an able report of the United States Bureau of Corporations. The extent of the General Electric influence is not fully revealed by its consolidated balance sheet. A very large number of corporations are connected with it through its subsidiaries and through corporations controlled by the subsidiaries or affiliated with them. There is a still wider circle of influence due to the fact that officers and directors of the General Electric Co. and its subsidiaries are also officers or directors of many other corporations, some of whose securities are owned by the General Electric Company. The General Electric Company holds, in the first place, all the common stock in three security holding companies, the United Electric Securities Company, the Electrical Securities Corporation, and the Electric Bond and Share Company directly. And through these corporations and their officers, the General Electric controls a large part of the water power of the United States. The water power companies in the General Electric Group are found in 18 states. These 18 states have 2,325,757 commercial horsepower developed or under construction. And this total, the General Electric Group includes 939,115 HP or 40.4%. The greatest amount of power controlled by the companies in the General Electric Group in any state is found in Washington. This is followed by New York, Pennsylvania, California, Montana, Iowa, Oregon, and Colorado. In five of the states shown in the table, the water power companies included in the General Electric Group control more than 50% of the commercial power developed and under construction. The percentage of power in the states included in the General Electric Group ranges from a little less than 2%. In Michigan, to nearly 80%. In Pennsylvania, in Colorado, they control 72%. In New Hampshire, 61%. In Oregon, 58%. And in Washington, 55%. Besides the power developed and under construction, water power concerns included in the General Electric Group own in the state shown in the table, 641,600 HP undeveloped. This water power control enables the General Electric Group to control other public service corporations. The water power companies subject to General Electric influence control the street railways in at least 16 cities and towns. The electric light plants in 78 cities and towns, gas plants in 19 cities and towns, and are affiliated with the electric light and gas plants in other towns. Though many of these communities, particularly those served with light only, are small, several of them are 
the most important in the states where these water power companies operate. The water power companies in the General Electric Group own, control, or are closely affiliated with the street railways in Portland and Salem, Oregon. Spokane, Washington, Great Falls, Montana, St. Louis, Missouri, Winona, Minnesota, Milwaukee, and Racine, Wisconsin, Elmira, New York, Asheville, and Raleigh, North Carolina, and other relatively less important towns. The towns in which the lighting plants, electric or gas, are owned or controlled include Portland, Salem, Astoria, and other towns in Oregon. Bellingham and other towns in Washington, Butte, Great Falls, Bozeman, and other towns in Montana, Leadville and Colorado Springs in Colorado, St. Louis, Missouri, Milwaukee, Racine, and several small towns in Wisconsin, Hudson and Rensselaer, New York, Detroit, Michigan, Asheville and Raleigh, North Carolina, and in fact, one or more towns in practically every community where developed water power is controlled by this group. In addition to the public service corporations thus controlled by the water power companies, subject to general electric influence, there are numerous public service corporations in other municipalities that purchase power from the hydroelectric developments controlled by or affiliated with the general electric company. This is true of Denver, Colorado, which has already been discussed. In Baltimore, Maryland, a water power concern in the General Electric Group, namely the Pennsylvania Water and Power Company, sells 20,000 HP to the Consolidated Gas, Electric Light and Power Company, which controls the entire light and power business of that city. The power to operate all the electric street railway systems of Buffalo, New York, and the General Electric Company, through the financing of public service companies, exercises a like influence in communities where there is no water power. It or its subsidiaries has acquired control of or an interest in the public service corporations of numerous cities where there is no water power connection, and it is affiliated with still others by virtue of common directors. This vast network of relationships between hydroelectric corporations through prominent officers and directors, the largest manufacturer of electrical machinery and supplies in the United States, is highly significant. It is possible that this relationship to such a large number of strong financial concerns through prominent officers and directors affords the General Electric Company an advantage that may place rivals at a corresponding disadvantage, whether or not this great financial power has been used to the particular disadvantage of any rival water power concern is not so important as the fact that such power exists and that it might be so used at any time. The Sherman Law The money trust cannot be broken if we allow its power to be constantly augmented. To break the money trust, we must stop that power at its source. The industrial trusts are among its most effective feeders. Those which are illegal should be dissolved. The creation of new ones should be prevented. To this end, the Sherman Law should be supplemented both by providing more efficient judicial machinery and by creating a commission with administrative functions to aid in enforcing the law. When that is done, another step will have been taken toward securing the new freedom. But restrictive legislation alone will not suffice. We should bear in mind the admonition with which the Commissioner of Corporations closes his review of our water power development. There is presented such a situation in water powers and other public utilities as might bring about at any time under a single management the control of a majority of the developed water powers in the United States and similar control over the public utilities in a vast number of cities and towns, including some of the most important in the country. We should conserve all rights which the federal government and the states now have in our natural resources, and there should be a complete separation of our industries from railroads and public utilities. 
End of chapter 7. Recording by John Thomas Kuz, Kuzmarski. Kuz. www.validateyourlife.com Other People's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis Chapter 8 A Curse of Bigness Bigness has been an important factor in the rise of the money trust. Big railroad systems, big industrial trusts, big public service companies, and as instruments of these big banks and big trust companies. J.P. Morgan and Company, in their letter of defense to the Peugeot Committee, urged the needs of big business as the justification for financial concentration. They declare that what they euphemistically call cooperation is simply a further result of the necessity for handling great transactions. That the country obviously requires not only the larger individual banks, but demands also that those banks shall cooperate to perform efficiently the country's business. And that a step backward along this line would mean a halt in industrial progress that would affect every wage earner from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The phrase, great transactions, is used by the bankers apparently as meaning large corporate security issues. Leading bankers have undoubtedly cooperated during the last 15 years in floating some very large security issues, as well as many small ones. But relatively few large issues were made necessary by great improvements undertaken or by industrial development. Improvements and development ordinarily proceed slowly. For them, even where the enterprise involves large expenditures, a series of smaller issues is usually more appropriate than a single large one. This is particularly true in the East, where the building of new railroads has practically ceased. The great security issues in which bankers have cooperated were, with relatively few exceptions, made either for the purpose of effecting combinations or as a consequence of such combinations. Furthermore, the combinations which made necessary these large security issues or underwritings were, in most cases, either contrary to existing statute law or contrary to laws recommended by the Interstate Commerce Commission or contrary to the laws of business efficiency. So both the financial concentration and the combinations which they have served were, in the main, against the public interest. Size, we are told, is not a crime. But size may, at least, become noxious by reason of the means through which it was attained or the uses to which it is put. And it is size, attained by combination, instead of natural growth, which has contributed so largely to our financial concentration. Let us examine a few cases. The Harriman Pacifics J.P. Morgan & Company, in urging the need of large banks and the cooperation of bankers, said, The Attorney General's recent approval of the Union Pacific Settlement calls for a single commitment on the part of bankers of $126 million. This $126 million commitment was not made to enable the Union Pacific to secure capital. On the contrary, it was a guarantee that it would succeed in disposing of its Southern Pacific stock to that amount. And when it had disposed of that stock, it was confronted with a serious problem. What to do with the proceeds? This huge underwriting became necessary solely because the Union Pacific had violated the Sherman Law, it had acquired that amount of Southern Pacific stock illegally, and the Supreme Court of the United States finally decreed that the illegality cease. This same illegal purchase had been the occasion, twelve years earlier, of another great transaction, the issue of a $100 million of 
Union Pacific bonds, which were sold to provide funds for acquiring the Southern Pacific and other stocks in violation of law. Bankers cooperated also to accomplish that. Union Pacific Improvements The Union Pacific and its auxiliary lines, the Oregon Short Line, the Oregon Railway and Navigation, and the Oregon-Washington Railroad, made in the 14 years ending June 30, 1912, issues of securities aggregating 375 million, 158,000, $183, of which $46,500,000 were refunded or redeemed. But the large security issues served mainly to supply funds for engaging in illegal combinations or stock speculation. The extraordinary improvements and additions that raised the Union Pacific Railroad to a high state of efficiency were provided mainly by the net earnings from the operation of its railroads. And note how great the improvements and additions were. Tracks were straightened, grades were lowered, bridges were rebuilt, heavy rails were laid, old equipment was replaced by new, and the cost of these was charged largely as operating expenses. Additional equipment was added, new lines were built or acquired, increasing the system by 3,524 miles of line. And still other improvements and betterments were made and charged to capital account. These expenditures aggregated $191,512,328. But it needed no large security issues to provide the capital thus wisely expended. The net earnings from the operations of these railroads were so large that nearly all these improvements and additions could have been made without issuing on the average more than $100 million a year of additional securities for new money, and the company still could have paid 6% dividends after 1906 when that rate was adopted. For a while, $13,679,452 a year on the average was charged to cost of road and equipment, the surplus net earnings and other funds would have yielded on the average $12,750,982 a year available for improvements and additions without raising money on new security issues. How the security proceeds were spent. The $375 million securities, except to the extent of about $13 million required for improvements, and the amounts applied for refunding and redemptions, were available to buy stocks and bonds of other companies. And some of the stocks so acquired were sold at large profits, providing further sums to be employed in stock purchases. The $375 million Union Pacific Line security issues, therefore, were not needed to supply funds for Union Pacific improvements, nor did these issues supply funds for the improvement of any of the companies in which the Union Pacific invested, except that certain amounts were advanced later to aid in financing the Southern Pacific. They served substantially no purpose save to transfer the ownership of railroad stocks from one set of persons to another. Here are some of the principal investments. 1. $91,657,500 in acquiring and financing the Southern Pacific. 2. $89,391,401 in acquiring the Northern Pacific stock and stock of the Northern Securities Company. 3. $45,466,000 $960 in acquiring Baltimore and Ohio stock. 4. $37,692,256 in acquiring Illinois Central stock. 5. $23,205,679 in acquiring New York Central stock. 6. 
$10,395,000 in acquiring Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe stock. 7. $8,946,781 in acquiring Chicago and Alton stock. 8. $11,610,187 in acquiring Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul stock. 9. $6,750,423 in acquiring Chicago and Northwestern stock. 10. $6,936,696 in acquiring Railroad Securities Company stock. Illinois Central Stock. The immediate effect of these stock acquisitions, as stated by the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1907, was merely this. Mr. Harriman may journey by steamship from New York to New Orleans, thence by rail to San Francisco, across the Pacific Ocean to China, and returning by another route to the United States, may go to Ogden by any one of three rail lines, and thence to Kansas City or Omaha, without leaving the deck or platform of a carrier, which he controls, and without duplicating any part of his journey. He has further what appears to be a dominant control in the Illinois Central Railroad, running directly north from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes, parallel to the Mississippi River, and 2,000 miles west of the Mississippi River, he controls the only line of railroad parallel to the Pacific coast and running from the Colorado River to the Mexican border. The testimony taken at this hearing shows that about 50,000 square miles of territory in the state of Oregon, surrounded by the lines of the Oregon Short Line Railroad Company, the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, and the Southern Pacific Company, is not developed while the funds of those companies which could be used for that purpose are being invested in stocks like the New York Central and other lines having only a remote relation to the territory in which the Union Pacific system is located. Mr. Harriman succeeded in becoming director of 27 railroads with 39,354 miles of line, and they extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. The Aftermath On September 9, 1909, less than twelve years after Mr. Harriman first became director in the Union Pacific, he died from overwork at the age of sixty-one. But it was not death only that had set a limit to his achievements. The multiplicity of his investments prevented him from performing for his other railroads the great service that had won him a worldwide reputation as manager and rehabilitator of the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific. Within a few months after Mr. Harriman's death, the serious equipment scandal on the Illinois Central became public, culminating in the probable suicide of one of the vice presidents of that company. The Chicago and Alton, in the management of which Mr. Harriman was prominent, from 1899 to 1907, as President, Chairman of the Board, or Executive Committeeman, has never regained the prosperity it enjoyed before he and his associates acquired control. The Pierre Marquette has passed again into receiver's hands. Long before Mr. Harriman's death, the Union Pacific had disposed of its Northern Pacific stock, because the Supreme Court of the United States declared the Northern Securities Company illegal, and dissolved the Northern Pacific Great Northern merger. Three years after his death, the Supreme Court of the United States ordered the Union Pacific Southern Pacific merger dissolved. By a strange irony, the law has permitted the Union Pacific to reap large profits from its illegal transactions in Northern Pacific and Southern Pacific stocks but many other stocks held as investments have entailed large losses. Stocks in the Illinois Central and other companies which cost the Union Pacific $129,894,991.72 had on November 15, 1913, 
a market value of only $87,851,500, showing a shrinkage of $42,043,491.72, and the average income from them, while held, was only about 4.30% on their cost. A Banker's Paradise Kuhn Loeb and Company were the Union Pacific bankers. It was in pursuance of a promise which Mr. Jacob H. Schliff, the senior partner, had given, pending the reorganization, that Mr. Harriman first became a member of the Executive Committee in 1897. Thereafter, combinations grew and crumbled, and there were vicissitudes in stock speculations. But the investment bankers prospered amazingly, and financial concentration proceeded without abatement. The bankers and their associates received the commissions paid for purchasing the stocks which the Supreme Court holds to have been acquired illegally and have retained them. The bankers received commissions for underwriting the securities issued to raise the money which to buy the stocks which the Supreme Court holds to have been illegally acquired and have retained them. The bankers received commissions paid for floating securities of the controlled companies while they were thus controlled in violation of law and have, of course, retained them. Finally, when, after years, a decree is entered to end the illegal combination, these same bankers are on hand to perform the services of undertaker and receive further commissions for their banker aid in enabling the law-breaking corporation to end its wrongdoing and to comply with the decree of the Supreme Court. And yet, throughout nearly all this long period, both before and after Mr. Harriman's death, two partners in Kuhn, Loeb & Company were directors or members of the Executive Committee of the Union Pacific, and as such must be deemed responsible with the others for the illegal acts. Indeed, these bankers have not only received commissions for the underwritings of transactions accomplished, though illegal, they have received commissions also for merely agreeing to underwrite a great transaction, which the authorities would not permit to be accomplished. The $126 million underwriting, that the single commitment on the part of the bankers to which J.P. Morgan and Company refer as being called for by the Attorney General's approval of the Union Pacific Settlement, never became effective, because the Public Service Commission of California refused to approve the terms of the settlement. But the Union Pacific nevertheless paid the Kuhn and Loeb Syndicate a large underwriting fee for having been ready and willing to serve should the opportunity arise. And another underwriting commission was paid when the Southern Pacific stock was finally distributed with the approval of Attorney General McReynolds, under the court's decree. Thus, the illegal purchase of the Southern Pacific stock yielded directly four crops of commissions, two when it was acquired and two when it was disposed of. And during the intervening period, the illegally controlled Southern Pacific yielded many more commissions to the bankers. For the schedules filed with the Pujo Committee show that Kuhn, Loeb & Company marketed, in addition to the Union Pacific securities above referred to, $334 million of Southern Pacific and Central Pacific securities between 1903 and 1911. The aggregate amount of the commissions paid to these bankers in connection with the Union Pacific-Southern Pacific transaction is not disclosed. It must have been very large, for not only were the transactions great, but the commissions were liberal. The Interstate Commerce Commission finds that bankers received about 5% on the purchase price for buying the first 750,000 shares of Southern Pacific stock, and the underwriting commission on the first $100 million of Union Pacific bonds issued to make that and other purchases was $5 million. How large the two underwriting commissions were which the Union Pacific paid in effecting the severance of this illegal merger, both the company and the bankers have declined to disclose. Furthermore, the Interstate Commerce Commission showed, clearly, 
while investigating the Union Pacific's purchase of the Chicago and Alton stock, that the banker's profits were by no means confined to commissions. The Burlington Such railroad combinations produced injury to the public far more serious than the heavy tax of bankers' commissions and profits. For, in nearly every case, the absorption into a great system of a theretofore independent railroad has involved the loss of financial independence to some community, property, or men, who thereby become subjects or satellites of the money trust. The passing of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy in 1901 to the Morgan Associates presents a striking example of this process. After the Union Pacific acquired the Southern Pacific stock in 1901, it sought control also of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, a most prosperous railroad, having then 7,912 miles of line. The Great Northern and Northern Pacific recognized that Union Pacific control of the Burlington would exclude them from much of Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and South Dakota. The two northern roads, which were already closely allied with each other, and with J.P. Morgan and Company, thereupon purchased for $215,227,000 of their joint 4% bonds, nearly all of the $100,324,000 par value outstanding Burlington stock. A struggle with the Union Pacific ensued, which yielded soon to harmonious cooperation. The Northern Securities Company was formed with $400 million capital, thereby merging the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, and the Burlington, and joining the Harriman, Kuhn Loeb with the Morgan Hill interests. Obviously, neither the issue of $215 million joint fours nor the issue of the $400 million Northern Securities stock supplied one dollar of funds for improvements of or addition to any of the four great railroad systems concerned in these large transactions. The sole effect of issuing $615 million of securities was to transfer stock from one set of persons to another, and the resulting harmonious cooperation was soon interrupted by the government proceedings, which ended with the dissolution of the Northern Securities Company. But the evil done outlived the combination. The Burlington had passed forever from its independent Boston owners to the Morgan allies, who remained in control. The Burlington, one of Boston's finest achievements, was the creation of John M. Forbes. He was a builder, not a combiner or banker, or wizard of finance. He was a simple, hard-working businessman. He had been a merchant in China at a time when China's trade was among America's big business. He had been connected with shipping and with manufacturers. He had the imagination of the great merchant, the patience and perseverance of the great manufacturer, the courage of the seafarer, and the broad view of the statesman. Bold but never reckless, Scrupulously careful of other people's money, he was ready, after due weighing of chances, to risk his own in enterprises promising success. He was in the best sense of the term a great adventurer. Thus equipped, Mr. Forbes entered, in 1852, upon those railroad enterprises which later developed into the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Largely with his own money, and that of friends who confided in him, he built these railroads and carried them through the panic of 57, when the great banking houses of those days lacked courage to assume the burdens of a struggling, ill-constructed line, staggering under financial difficulties. Under his wise management and that of the men whom he trained, the little Burlington became a great system. It was built on honor and managed honorably. It weathered every other great financial crisis as it did that of 1857. It reached maturity without reorganization or the sacrifice of a single stockholder or bondholder. Investment bankers had no place on the Burlington Board of Directors. 
nor had the banker practice of being on both sides of a bargain. I am unwilling, said Mr. Forbes, early in his career, to run the risk of having the imputation of buying from a company in which I am interested. About twenty years later, he made his greatest fight to rescue the Burlington from the control of certain contractor directors, whom his biographer, Mr. Pearson, describes as persons of integrity who had conceived that in their twofold capacity as contractors and directors they were fully able to deal with themselves justly. Mr. Forbes thought otherwise. The stockholders whom he had aroused sided with him, and he won. Mr. Forbes was the pioneer among Boston Railroad builders. His example and his success inspired many others, for Boston was not lacking then in men who were builders, though some lacked his wisdom and some his character. Her enterprise and capital constructed, in large part, the Union Pacific, the Atchison, the Mexican Central, the Wisconsin Central, and twenty-four other railroads in the West and South. One by one, these Western and Southern railroads passed out of Boston control, the greater part of them into the control of the Morgan Allies. Before the Burlington was surrendered, Boston had begun to lose her dominion, even over the railroads of New England. In 1900, the Boston and Albany was leased to the New York Central, a Morgan property, and a few years later another Morgan railroad, the New Haven, acquired control of nearly every other transportation line in New England. Now nothing is left of Boston's railroad dominion in the west and south except the Eastern Kentucky Railroad, a line 36 miles long, and her control of the railroads of Massachusetts is limited to the Grafton-Upton with 19 miles of line, and the Boston, Revere, Beach, and Lynn, a passenger road 13 miles long. THE NEW HAVEN MONOPOLY The rise of the New Haven Monopoly presents another striking example of combination as a developer of financial concentration, and it illustrates also the use to which large security issues are put. In 1892, when Mr. Morgan entered the New Haven Directorate, it was a very prosperous little railroad, with capital liabilities of $25 million, paying 10% dividends, and operating 508 miles of line. By 1899, the capitalization had grown to $80,477,600, but the aggregate mileage had also grown, mainly through merger or lease of other lines, to 2017. Fourteen years later, in 1913, when Mr. Morgan died and Mr. Mellon resigned, the mileage was 1,097, just 20 miles less than in 1899, but the capital liabilities had increased to $425,935,000. Of course, the business of the railroad had grown largely in those 14 years. The roadbed was improved, bridges built, additional tracks added, and much equipment purchased. And for all this, new capital was needed, and additional issues were needed also, because the company paid out in dividends more than it earned. But of the capital increase, over $200 million was expended in the acquisition of stock or other securities of some 120 other railroads, steamships, street railway, electric, light, gas, and water companies. It was these outside properties which made necessary the much-discussed $67 million 6% bond issue, as well as other large and expensive security issues. For in these 14 years, the improvements on the railroad, including new equipment, have cost on the average only $10 million a year. The New Haven Bankers Few, if any, of those 121 companies which the New Haven acquired had, prior to their absorption by it, been financed by J.P. Morgan and Company. The needs of the Boston and Maine and Maine Central, the largest group, had, for generations, been met mainly through their own stockholders or through Boston banking houses. 
No investment banker had been a member of the board of directors of either of those companies. The New York, Ontario, and Western, the next largest of the acquired railroads, had been financed in New York, but by persons apparently entirely independent of the Morgan allies. The smaller Connecticut railroads, now combined into central New England, had been financed mainly in Connecticut or by independent New York bankers. The financing of the street railway companies had been done largely by individual financiers or by small and independent bankers in the states or cities where the companies operate. Some of the steamship companies had been financed by their owners, some through independent bankers. As a result of the absorption of these 121 companies into the New Haven system, the financing of all of these railroads, steamship companies, street railways, and other corporations were made tributary to J.P. Morgan and Company, and the independent bankers were eliminated or became satellites. And this financial concentration was proceeded with, although practically every one of the 121 companies was acquired by the New Haven in violation of either of the state or federal law, or of both. Enforcement of the Sherman Act will doubtless result in dissolving this unwieldy, illegal combination. The Coal Monopoly Proof of the cooperation of the anthracite railroads is furnished by the ubiquitous presence of George F. Baker on the board of directors of the Reading the Jersey Central, the Lackawanna, the Lehigh, the Erie, and the New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroads, which together control nearly all the unmined anthracite as well as the actual tonnage. These roads have been an important factor in the development of the Money Trust. They are charged by the Department of Justice with fundamental violations of both the Sherman Law and the Commodity Clause of the Hepburn Act which prohibits a railroad from carrying in interstate trade any commodity in which it has an interest, direct or indirect. Nearly every large issue of securities made in the last 14 years by any of these railroads, except the Erie, has been in connection with some act of combination. The combination of the anthracite railroads to suppress the construction through the Temple Iron Company of a competing coal road has already been declared illegal by the Supreme Court of the United States, and in the bituminous coal field, the Kanawha District, the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, has recently decreed that a similar combination by the Lakeshore, the Chesapeake and Ohio, and the Hocking Valley be dissolved. Other Railroad Combinations The cases of the Union Pacific and of the New Haven are typical, not exceptional. Our railroad history presents numerous instances of large security issues made wholly or mainly to affect combinations. Some of these combinations have been proper as a means of securing natural feeders or extensions of main lines. But far more of them have been dictated by the desire to suppress active or potential competition, or by personal ambition or greed, or by the mistaken belief that efficiency grows with size. Thus the monstrous combination of the Rock Island and the St. Louis and San Francisco, with over 14,000 miles of line, is recognized now to have been obviously inefficient. It was severed voluntarily, but, had it not been, must have crumbled soon from inherent defects, if not as a result of proceedings under the Sherman Law. Both systems are suffering now from the effects of this unwise combination. The Frisco, itself greatly overcombined, has paid the penalty in receivership. The Rock Island, a name once expressive of railroad efficiency and stability, has, through its excessive recapitalizations and combinations, become a football of speculators and a source of great apprehension to confiding investors. The combination of the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton, and the Pierre Marquette led to several receiverships. There are, of course, other combinations which have not been disastrous to the owners of the railroads. 
but the fact that a railroad combination has not been disastrous does not necessarily justify it. The evil of the concentration of power is obvious, and as combination necessarily involves such concentration of power, the burden of justifying a combination should be placed upon those who seek to effect it. For instance, what public good has been subserved by allowing the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Company to issue $50 million of securities to acquire control of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, a widely extended, self-sufficient system of 5,000 miles, which, under the wise management of President Milton H. Smith, had prospered continuously for many years before the acquisition, and which has gross earnings nearly twice as large as those of the Atlantic Coast Line. The legality of this combination has been recently challenged by Senator Lee, and an investigation by the Interstate Commerce Commission has been ordered. The Pennsylvania The reports from the Pennsylvania suggest the inquiry whether even this generally well-managed railroad is not suffering from excessive bigness. After 1898, it, too, bought in large amounts stock in other railroads, including the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Baltimore and Ohio, and the Norfolk and Western. In 1906, it sold all its Chesapeake and Ohio stock and a majority of its Baltimore and Ohio and Norfolk and Western holdings. Later, it reversed its policy and resumed stock purchases, acquiring, among others, more Norfolk and Western and New York, New Haven, and Hartford, and on December 31, 1912, held securities valued at $331,909,154.32, of which, however, a large part represents Pennsylvania system securities. These securities, mostly stocks, constitute about one-third of the total assets of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The income on these securities in 1912 averaged only 4.30% on their valuation, while the Pennsylvania paid 6% on its stock. But the cost of carrying these foreign stocks is not limited to the difference between this income and outgo. To raise money on these stocks, the Pennsylvania had to issue its own securities, and there is such a thing as an oversupply even of Pennsylvania securities. Oversupply of any stock depresses market values and increases the cost to Pennsylvania of raising new money. Recently came the welcome announcement of the management that it will dispose of its stocks in the anthracite coal mines, and it is intimated that it will divest itself also of other holdings and companies, like the Cambria Steel Company, extraneous to the business of railroading. This policy should be extended to include the disposition also of all stocks in other railroads, like the Norfolk and Western, the Southern Pacific, and the New Haven, which are not part of the Pennsylvania system. Recommendations Six years ago, the Interstate Commerce Commission, after investigating the Union Pacific transaction above referred to, recommended legislation to remedy the evils there disclosed. Upon concluding recently its investigation of the New Haven, the Commission repeated and amplified those recommendations, saying, No student of the railroad problem can doubt that a most prolific source of financial disaster and complication to railroads in the past has been the desire and ability of railroad managers to engage in enterprises outside the legitimate operations of their railroads especially by the acquisition of other railroads and their securities. The evil which results, first to the investing public and finally to the general public, cannot be corrected after the transaction has taken place. It can be easily and effectively prohibited. In our opinion, the following propositions lie at the foundation of all adequate regulation of interstate railroads. 1. Every interstate railroad should be prohibited from spending money or incurring liability or acquiring property not in the operation of its railroad or in the legitimate improvement, extension, or development of that railroad. 
2. No interstate railroad should be permitted to lease or purchase any other railroad, nor to acquire the stocks or securities of any other railroad, nor to guarantee the same, directly or indirectly, without the approval of the federal government. 3. No stocks or bonds should be issued by an interstate railroad except for the purpose sanctioned in the two preceding paragraphs, and none should be issued without the approval of the federal government. It may be unwise to attempt to specify the price at which and the manner in which railroad stocks and securities shall be disposed of, but it is easy and safe to define the purpose for which they may be issued, and to confine the expenditure of the money realized to that purpose. These recommendations are in substantial accord with those adopted by the National Association of Railway Commissioners. They should be enacted into law, and they should be supplemented by amendments of the Commodity Clause of the Hepburn Act, so that 1. Railroads will be effectively prohibited from owning stock in corporations whose products they transport. 2. Such corporations will be prohibited from owning important stock holdings in railroads, and 3. Holding companies will be prohibited from controlling, as does the reading, both a railroad and corporations whose commodities it transports. If laws such as these are enacted and duly enforced, we shall be protected from a reoccurrence of tragedies like the New Haven, of domestic scandals like the Chicago and Alton, and of international ones like the Frisco. We shall also escape from that inefficiency which is attended upon excessive size. But what is far more important, we shall, by legislation, remove a potent factor in financial concentration. Decentralization will begin. The liberated smaller units will find no difficulty in financing their needs without bowing the knee to money lords. And a long step will have been taken toward attainment of the new freedom. End of chapter 8 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 9 of Other People's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Money by Louise D. Brandes Chapter 9 The Failure of Banker Management There is not one moral, but many, to be drawn from the decline of the New Haven and the fall of Mellon. That history offers texts for many sermons. It illustrates the evils of monopoly, the curse of bigness, the futility of lying, and the pitfalls of law-breaking. But perhaps the most impressive lesson that it should teach to investors is the failure of banker management. Banker Control For years, J.P. Morgan and Company were the fiscal agents of the New Haven. For years, Mr. Morgan was the director of the company. He gave to that property probably closer personal attention than to any other of his many interests. Stockholders' meetings are rarely interesting or important, and few indeed must have been the occasions when Mr. Morgan attended any stockholders' meeting of other companies in which he was a director. But it was his habit, when in America, to be present at meetings of the New Haven. In 1907, when the policy of monopolistic expansion was first challenged, and again in the meeting of 1909, after Massachusetts had unwisely accorded its sanction to the Boston and Maine merger, Mr. Morgan himself moved the large increases of stock, which were unanimously voted. Of course he attended the important director's meeting. His will was law. President Mellon indicated this in his statement before Interstate Commerce Commissioner Prudy, while discussing the New York, Westchester, and Boston. The railroad without a terminal in New York which cost the New Haven $1,500,000 a mile to acquire, and was then costing it, in operating deficits and interest charges, $100,000 a month to run. Quote, I am in a very embarrassing position, Mr. Commissioner, 
regarding the New York, Westchester, and Boston. I have never been enthusiastic or at all optimistic of its being a good investment for our company in the present or in the immediate future. But people in whom I had greater confidence than I have in myself thought it was wise and desirable. I yielded my judgment. Indeed, I don't know that it would have made much difference whether I yielded or not. End quote. The Banker's Responsibility Bankers are credited with being a conservative force in the community. The tradition lingers that they are preeminently safe and sane. And yet the most grievous fault of this banker-managed railroad has been its financial recklessness, a fault that has already brought heavy losses to many thousands of small investors throughout New England for whom bankers are supposed to be natural guardians. In a community where its railroad stocks have for generations been deemed absolutely safe investments, the passing of the New Haven and of the Boston and Maine dividends after an unbroken dividend record of generations comes as a disaster. This disaster is due mainly to enterprises outside the legitimate operations of these railroads, for no railroad company has equaled the New Haven in the quantity and extravagance of its outside enterprises. But it must be remembered that neither the president of the New Haven nor any other railroad manager could engage in such transactions without the sanction of the board of directors. It is the directors, not Mr. Mellon, who should bear the responsibility. Close scrutiny of the transactions discloses no justification. On the contrary, scrutiny serves only to make more clear the gravity of the errors committed. Not merely were recklessly extravagant acquisitions made in mad pursuit of monopoly, but the financial judgment, the financiering itself, was conspicuously bad. To pay for property several times what it is worth, to engage in grossly unwise enterprises, are errors of which no conservative directors should be found guilty. For perhaps the most important function of directors is to test the conclusions and curb by calm counsel the excessive zeal of two ambitious managers. But while we have no right to expect from bankers exceptionally good judgment in ordinary business matters, we do have a right to expect from them prudence, reasonably good financiering, and insistence upon straightforward accounting. And it is just the lack of these qualities in the New Haven management to which the severe criticism of the Interstate Commerce Commission is particularly directed. Commissioner Prudy calls attention to the vast increase of capitalization. During the nine years beginning July 1, 1903, the capital of the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad Company itself increased from $93 million to about $417 million, excluding premiums. That fact alone would not convict the management of reckless financiering but the fact that so little of the new capital was represented by stock might well raise a question as to its conservativeness. For the indebtedness, including guarantees, was increased over 20 times, from about $14 million to $300 million, while the stock outstanding in the hands of the public was not doubled, $80 million to $158 million. Still, in these days of large things, even such growth of corporate liabilities might be consistent with safe and sane management. But what can be said in defense of the financial judgment of the banker management under which these two railroads find themselves confronted in the fateful year 1913 with a most disquieting floating indebtedness? On March 31, the New Haven had outstanding $43 million in short-time notes. The Boston and Maine had then outstanding 24,500,000, which have been increased since to $27 million, and additional notes have been issued by several of its subsidiary lines. Mainly to meet its share of these loans, the New Haven, which before its great expansion could sell at par 3.5% bonds convertible into stock at $150 a share, was so eager to issue at par $67,500,000 of its 6% 20-year bonds convertible into stock as to agree to pay J.P. Morgan & Company a 2.5% underwriting commission. 
True, money was tight then. But is it not very bad financiering to be so unprepared for the tight money market which had long been expected? Indeed, the New Haven's management particularly ought to have avoided such an error, for it committed a similar one in the tight money market of 1907 to 1908, when it had to sell at par $39 million of its 6% 40-year bonds. These huge short-time borrowings of the system were not due to unexpected emergencies or to their monetary conditions. They were of gradual growth. On June 30, 1910, the two companies owed in short-term notes only $10,180,364. By June 30, 1911, the amount had grown to $30,759,959. By June 30, 1912, to $45,395,000, and in 1913, to over $70 million. Of course, the rate of interest on the loans increased also very largely, and these loans were incurred unnecessarily. They represent, in the main, not improvements on the New Haven or on the Boston and Maine railroads, but money borrowed either to pay for stocks in other companies, which these companies could not afford to buy, or to pay dividends which had not been earned. In five years out of the last six, the New Haven Railroad has, on its own showing, paid dividends in excess of the year's earnings, and the annual deficits disclosed would have been much larger if proper charges for depreciation of equipment and of steamships had been made. In each of the last three years, during which the New Haven had absolute control of the Boston and Maine, the latter paid out in dividends so much in excess of earnings that before April 1913, the surplus accumulated in earlier years had been converted into a deficit. Surely these facts show, at least, an extraordinary lack of financial prudence. Why Banker Management Failed Now, how can the failure of the banker management of the New Haven be explained? A few have questioned the ability, a few the integrity of the bankers. Commissioner Prudy attributed the mistakes made to the company's pursuit of a transportation monopoly. The reason, says he, quote, is as apparent as the fact itself. The present management of that company started out with the purpose of controlling the transportation facilities of New England. In the accomplishment of that purpose, it bought what must be had and paid what must be paid. To this purpose and its attempted execution can be traced every one of these financial misfortunes and derelictions. End quote. But it still remains to find the cause of the bad judgment exercised by the eminent banker management in entering upon and in carrying out the policy of monopoly. For there were as grave errors in the execution of the policy of monopoly as in its adoption. Indeed, it was the aggregation of important errors of detail which compelled first the reduction, then the passing of dividends, and which ultimately impaired the company's credit. The failure of the banker management of the New Haven cannot be explained as the shortcomings of individuals. The failure was not accidental. It was not exceptional. It was the natural result of confusing the functions of banker and businessman. Undivided Loyalty The banker should be detached from the business for which he performs the banking service. This detachment is desirable, in the first place, in order to avoid conflict of interest. The relation of banker directors to corporations which they finance has been a subject of just criticism. Their conflicting interests necessarily prevent single-minded devotion to the corporation. When a banker director of a railroad decides as railroad man that it shall issue securities, and then sells them to himself as banker, fixing the price at which they are to be taken, there is necessarily grave danger that the interests of the railroad may suffer, suffer both through issuing of securities which ought not to be issued, and from selling them at a price less favorable to the company than should have been obtained for it is ordinarily impossible for a banker director to judge impartially between the corporation and himself. Even if he succeeded in being impartial, 
the relation would not conduce to the best interests of the company. The best bargains are made when buyer and seller are represented by different persons. Detachment and Essential But the objection to banker management does not rest wholly, or perhaps mainly, upon the importance of avoiding divided loyalty. A complete detachment of the banker from the corporation is necessary in order to secure for the railroad the benefit of the clearest financial judgment. For the banker's judgment will be necessarily clouded by participation in the management or by ultimate responsibility for the policy actually pursued. It is outside financial advice which the railroad needs. Long ago it was recognized that, quote, a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client, end quote. The essential reason for this is that soundness of judgment is easily obscured by self-interest. Similarly, it is not the proper function of the banker to construct, purchase, or operate railroads, or to engage in industrial enterprises. The proper function of the banker is to give to or withhold credit from other concerns, to purchase or to refuse to purchase securities from other concerns, and to sell securities to other customers. The proper exercise of this function demands that the banker should be wholly detached from the concern whose credit or securities are under consideration. His decision to grant or to withhold credit, to purchase or not to purchase securities, involves passing judgment on the efficiency of the management or the soundness of the enterprise, and he ought not to occupy a position where in so doing he is passing judgment on himself. Of course, detachment does not imply a lack of knowledge. The banker should act only with full knowledge, just as a lawyer should act only with full knowledge. The banker who undertakes to make loans to or purchase securities from a railroad for sale to his other customers ought to have as full knowledge of its affairs as does its legal adviser. But the banker should not be, in any sense, his own client. He should not, in the capacity of banker, pass judgment upon the wisdom of his own plans or acts as railroad man. Such a detached attitude on the part of the banker is demanded also in the interest of his other customers, the purchasers of corporate securities. The investment banker stands toward a large part of his customers in a position of trust, which should be fully recognized. The small investors, particularly the women, who are holding an ever-increasing proportion of our corporate securities, commonly buy on the recommendation of their bankers. The small investors do not, and in most cases cannot, ascertain for themselves the facts on which to base a proper judgment as to the soundness of securities offered. And even if these investors were furnished with the facts, they lack the business experience essential to forming a proper judgment. Such investors need, and are entitled, to have the banker's advice, and obviously their unbiased advice and the advice cannot be unbiased where the banker, as part of the corporation's management, has participated in the creation of the securities which are the subject of sale to the investor. Is it conceivable that the great house of Morgan would have aided in providing the new haven with the hundreds of millions so unwisely expended, if its judgment had not been clouded by participation in the new haven's management? End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Other People's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis. Chapter Ten The Inefficiency of the Oligarchs. We must break the money trust, or the money trust will break us. The Interstate Commerce Commission said in its report on the most disastrous of the recent wrecks on the New Haven Railroad, On this directorate were and are men whom the confiding public recognize as magicians in the art of finance and wizards in the construction, operation, and consolidation of great systems of railroads. 
the public therefore rested secure that with the knowledge of the railroad art possessed by such men investments in travel should both be safe experience has shown that this reliance of the public was not justified as to either finance or safety this failure of banker management is not surprising the surprise is that men should have supposed it would succeed for banker management contravenes the fundamental laws of human limitations first that no man can serve two masters second that a man cannot at the same time do many things well seeming successes there are numerous seeming exceptions to these rules and a relatively few real ones of course many banker managed properties have been prosperous some for a long time at the expense of the public some for a shorter time because of the impetus attained before they were banker managed it is not difficult to have a large net income where one has the field to oneself has all the advantage privilege can give and may charge all the traffic will bear and even in competitive business the success of a long-established well-organized business with a widely extended good will must continue for a considerable time especially if buttressed by intertwined relations constantly giving it the preference over competitors the real test of efficiency comes when success has to be struggled for when natural or legal conditions limit the charges which may be made for the goods sold or service rendered our banker managed railroads have recently been subjected to such a test and they have failed to pass it it is only says goethe when working within limitations that the master is disclosed why oligarchy fails banker management fails partly because the private interest destroys soundness of judgment and undermines loyalty it fails partly also because banker directors are led by their occupation and often even by the mere fact of their location remote from the operated properties to apply a false test in making their decisions prominent in the banker director mind is always this thought what will be the probable effect of our action upon the market value of the company's stock and bonds or indeed generally upon the stock exchange values the stock market is so much a part of the investment banker's life that he cannot help being affected by this consideration however disinterested he may be the stock market is sensitive facts are often misinterpreted by the street or by investors and with the best of intentions directors susceptible to such influences are led to unwise decisions in the effort to prevent misinterpretations thus expenditures necessary for maintenance or for the ultimate good of a property are often deferred by banker directors because of the belief that the making of them now would by showing smaller net earnings create a bad and even false impression on the market dividends are paid which should not be because of the effect which it is believed reduction or suspension would have upon the market value of the company's securities to exercise a sound judgment in the difficult affairs of business is at best a delicate operation and no man can successfully perform that function whose mind is diverted however innocently from the study of what is best in the long run for the company of which i am a director the banker director is peculiarly liable to such distortion of judgment by reason of his occupation and his environment but there is a further reason why ordinarily banker management must fail the element of time the banker with his multiplicity of interests cannot ordinarily give the time essential to proper supervision and to acquiring that knowledge of the facts necessary to the exercise of sound judgment the century dictionary tells us that a director is one who directs one who guides superintends governs and manages real efficiency in any business in which conditions are ever changing must ultimately depend in large measure upon the correctness of judgment exercised almost from day to day on the important problems as they arise and how can the leading bankers necessarily engrossed in the problems of their own vast private business 
get time to know and to correlate the facts concerning so many other complex businesses besides they start usually with ignorance of the particular business which they are supposed to direct when the last paper was signed which created the steel trust one of the lawyers as mr perkins frankly tells us said that signature is the last one necessary to put the steel industry on a large scale into the hands of men who do not know anything about it avocations of the oligarchs the new haven system is not a railroad but an agglomeration of a railroad plus one hundred and twenty one separate corporations control of which was acquired by the new haven after that railroad attained its full growth of about two thousand miles of line in administering the railroad and each of the properties formerly managed through these one hundred and two separate companies there must arise from time to time difficult questions on which the directors should pass judgment the real managing directors of the new haven system during the decade of its decline were j pierpont morgan george f baker and william rockefeller mr morgan was until his death in nineteen thirteen the head of perhaps the largest banking house in the world mr baker was until nineteen o nine president and then chairman of the board of directors of one of america's leading banks the first national of new york and mr rockefeller was until nineteen eleven president of the standard oil company each was well advanced in years yet each of these men besides the duties of his own vast business and important private interests undertook to guide superintend govern and manage not only the new haven but also the following other corporations some of which were similarly complex mr morgan forty-eight corporations including forty railroad corporations with at least one hundred subsidiary companies and sixteen thousand miles of line three banks and trust or insurance companies five industrial and public service companies mr baker forty-eight corporations including fifteen railroad corporations with at least one hundred and fifty-eight subsidiaries and thirty-seven thousand four hundred miles of track eighteen banks and trust or insurance companies fifteen public service corporations and industrial concerns mr rockefeller thirty-seven corporations including twenty-three railroad corporations with at least one hundred and seventeen subsidiary companies and twenty six thousand four hundred miles of line five banks trust or insurance companies nine public service companies and industrial concerns substitutes it has been urged that in view of the heavy burdens which the leaders of finance assume in directing business america we should be patient of error and refrain from criticism lest the leaders be deterred from continuing to perform this public service a very respectable boston daily said a few days after commissioner mccord's report on the north haven wreck it is believed that the new haven pillory repeated with some frequency will make the part of railroad director quite undesirable and hard to fill and more and more avoided by responsible men indeed it may even become so that men will have to be paid a substantial salary to compensate them in some degree for the risk involved in being on the board of directors but there is no occasion for alarm the american people have as little need of oligarchy in business as in politics there are thousands of men in america who could have performed for the new haven stockholders the task of one who guides superintends governs and manages better than did mr morgan mr baker and mr rockefeller for though possessing less native ability even the average businessman would have done better than they because working under proper conditions there is great strength in serving with singleness of purpose one master only there is great strength in having time to give to a business the attention which its difficult problems demand and tens of thousands more americans could be rendered competent to guide our important businesses liberty is the greatest developer herodotus tells us that while the tyrants ruled the athenians were no better fighters than their neighbors but when freed they immediately surpassed all others if industrial democracy 
true cooperation should be substituted for industrial absolutism there would be no lack of industrial leaders england's big business england too has big business but her big business is the cooperative wholesale society with a wonderful story of fifty years of beneficent growth its annual turnover is now about a hundred and fifty million dollars an amount exceeded by the sales of only a few american industrials an amount larger than the gross receipts of any american railroad except the pennsylvania and the new york central systems its business is very diversified for its purpose is to supply the needs of its members it includes that of wholesale dealer of manufacturer of grower of miner of banker of insurer and of carrier it operates the biggest flour mills and the biggest shoe factory in all great britain it manufactures woolen cloths all kinds of men's women's and children's clothing a dozen kinds of prepared foods and as many household articles it operates creameries it carries on every branch of the printing business it is now buying coal lands it has a bacon factory in denmark and a tallow and oil factory in australia it grows tea in ceylon and through all the purchasing done by the society runs this general principle go direct to the source of production whether at home or abroad so as to save commissions of middlemen and agents accordingly it has buyers and warehouses in the united states canada australia spain denmark and sweden it owns steamers plying between continental and english ports it has an important banking department it insures the property and person of its members every one of these departments is conducted in competition with the most efficient concerns in their respective lines in great britain the cooperative wholesale society makes its purchases and manufactures its products in order to supply the thirteen hundred and ninety nine local distributive cooperative societies scattered over all england but each local society is at liberty to buy from the wholesale society or not as it chooses and they buy only if the cooperative wholesale sells at market prices this the cooperative actually does and it is able besides to return to the local a fair dividend on its purchases industrial democracy now how are the directors of this great business chosen not by england's leading bankers or other notabilities supposed to possess unusual wisdom but democratically by all of the people interested in the operations of the society and the number of such persons who have directly or indirectly a voice in the selection of the directors of the english cooperative wholesale society is two million seven hundred and fifty thousand for the directors of the wholesale society are elected by vote of the delegates of the one thousand three hundred and ninety nine retail societies and the delegates of the retail societies are in turn selected by the members of the local societies that is by the consumers on the principle of one man one vote regardless of the amount of capital contributed note what kind of men these industrial democrats select to exercise executive control of their vast organization not all wise bankers or their dummies but men who have risen from the ranks of cooperation men who by conspicuous service in the local societies have won the respect and confidence of their fellows the directors are elected for one year only but a director is rarely unseated j t w mitchell was president of the society continuously for twenty-one years thirty-two directors are selected in this manner each gives to the business of the society his whole time and attention and the aggregate salaries of the thirty-two is less than that of many a single executive in american corporations for these directors of england's big business serve each for a salary of about fifteen hundred dollars a year the cooperative wholesale society of england is the oldest and largest of these institutions but similar wholesale societies exist in fifteen other countries the scotch society which william maxwell has served most efficiently as president for thirty years at a salary never exceeding thirty eight dollars a week 
has a turnover of more than fifty million dollars a year a remedy for trusts albert sonicson general secretary of the cooperative league tells in the american review of reviews for april nineteen thirteen how the swedish wholesale society curbed the sugar trust how it crushed the margarine combine compelling it to dissolve after having lost two million three hundred thousand crowns in the struggle and how in switzerland the wholesale society forced the dissolution of the shoe manufacturers association he tells also this memorable incident six years ago at an international congress in cremona dr hans muller a swiss delegate presented a resolution by which an international wholesale society should be created luigi luzzati italian minister of state and an ardent member of the movement was in the chair those who were present say luzzati paused his eyes lighted up and then dramatically raising his hand he said dr muller proposes to the assembly a great idea that of opposing to the great trusts the rockefellers of the world a world-wide cooperative alliance which shall become so powerful as to crush the trusts cooperation in america america has no wholesale cooperative society able to grapple with the trusts but it has some very strong retail societies like the tamarack of michigan which has distributed in dividends to its members one million one hundred and forty four thousand dollars in twenty three years the recent high cost of living has greatly stimulated interest in the cooperative movement and john graham books reports that we have already about three hundred and fifty local distributive societies the movement towards federation is progressing there are over one hundred cooperative stores in minnesota wisconsin and other northwestern states many of which were organized by or through the zealous work of mr towsley and his associates of the right relationship league and are in some ways affiliated in new york city eighty-three organizations are affiliated with the cooperative league in new jersey the societies have federated into the american cooperative alliance of northern new jersey in california long the seat of effective cooperative work a central management committee is developing and progressive wisconsin has recently legislated wisely to develop cooperation throughout the state among our farmers the interest in cooperation is especially keen the federal government has just established a separate bureau of the department of agriculture to aid in the study development and introduction of the best methods of cooperation in the working of farms in buying and in distribution and special attention is now being given to farm credits a field of cooperation in which continental europe has achieved complete success and to which david lubin america's delegate to the international institute of agriculture at rome has among others done much to direct our attention people's savings bank the german farmer has achieved democratic banking the thirteen thousand little cooperative credit associations with an average member of about ninety persons are truly banks of the people by the people and for the people first the bank's resources are of the people these aggregate about five hundred million dollars of this amount three hundred and seventy five million dollars represents the farmer's savings deposits fifty million dollars the farmer's current deposits six million dollars the farmer's share capital and thirteen million dollars amounts earned and placed in the reserved thus nearly nine-tenths of these large resources belong to the farmers that is to the members of the banks second the banks are managed by the people that is the members and membership is easily attained for the average amount of paid-up share capital was in nineteen o nine less than five dollars per member each member has one vote regardless of the number of his shares or the amount of his deposits these members elect the officers the committees and trustees and often even the treasurer 
serve without pay so that the expenses of the banks are on average about a hundred and fifty dollars a year third the banks are for the people the farmer's money is loaned by the farmer to the farmer at a low rate of interest usually four per cent to six per cent the shareholders receiving on their shares the same rate of interest that the borrowers pay on their loans thus the resources of all farmers are made available to each farmer for productive purposes this democratic rural banking is not confined to germany as henry w wolf says in his book on cooperative banks propagating themselves by their own merits little people's cooperative banks have overspread germany italy austria hungary switzerland belgium russia is following up those countries france is striving strenuously for the possession of cooperative credit servia rumania and bulgaria have made such credit their own canada has scored its first success on the road to its acquisition cyprus and even jamaica have made their first start ireland has substantial first fruits to show of her economic sowings south africa is groping its way to the same goal egypt has discovered the necessity of cooperative banks even by the side of lord cromer's pet creation the richly endowed agricultural bank india has made a beginning full of promise and even in far japan and in china people are trying to acclimatize the more perfective organizations of schultz dielich and raffesein the entire world seems girdled with a ring of cooperative credit only the united states and great britain still lag lamentably behind bankers savings banks the savings banks of america present a striking contrast to these democratic banks our savings banks also have performed a great service they have provided for the people's funds safe depositories with some income return thereby they have encouraged thrift and have created among other things reserves for the proverbial rainy day they have also discouraged old stocking hoarding which diverts the money of the country from the channels of trade american savings banks are also in a sense banks of the people for it is the people's money which is administered by them the four and a half billion dollars deposits in two thousand american savings banks belong to about ten million people who have an average deposit of about four hundred and fifty dollars but our savings banks are not banks by the people nor in the full sense for the people first american savings banks are not managed by the people the stock savings banks most prevalent in the middle west and the south are purely commercial enterprises managed of course by the stockholders representatives the mutual savings banks most prevalent in the eastern states have no stockholders but the depositors have no voice in the management the banks are managed by trustees for the people practically a self-constituted and self-perpetuating body composed of leading and to a large extent public-spirited citizens among them at least in the larger cities there is apt to be a predominance of investment bankers and bank directors thus the three largest savings banks of boston whose aggregate deposits exceed those of the other eighteen banks have together eighty-one trustees of these fifty-two are investment bankers or directors in other massachusetts banks or trust companies second the funds of our savings banks whether stock or purely mutual are not used mainly for the people the depositors are allowed interest usually from three to four per cent in the mutual savings banks they receive ultimately all the net earnings but the money gathered in these reservoirs is not used to aid productively persons of the classes who make the deposits the depositors are largely wage earners salaried people or members of small tradesmen's families statically the money is used for them dynamically it is used for the capitalist for rare indeed are the instances when savings banks monies are loaned to advance productively one of the depositor class 
such persons would seldom be able to provide the required security and it is doubtful whether their small needs would in any event receive consideration in nineteen twelve the largest of boston's mutual savings banks the provident institution for savings which is the pioneer mutual savings bank of america managed fifty three million dollars of people's money nearly one half of the resources twenty four million two hundred and sixty two thousand seventy two dollars was invested in bonds state municipal railroad railway and telephone and in bank stock or was deposited in national banks or trust companies two-fifths of the resources twenty million seven hundred and sixty four thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars were loaned on real estate mortgages and the average amount of a loan was fifty two thousand five hundred and sixty nine dollars one-seventh of the resources seven million five hundred and sixty six thousand six hundred and twelve dollars was loaned on personal security and the average of each of these loans was fifty four thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars obviously the small man is not conspicuous among the borrowers and these large-scale investments do not even serve the individual depositor especially well for this bank pays its depositors a rate of interest lower than the average even our admirable postal savings bank system serves productively mainly the capitalist these postal savings stations are in fact catch basins merely which collect the people's money for distribution among the national banks progress alphonse desjardins of levis province of quebec has demonstrated that cooperative credit associations are applicable also to at least some urban communities levis situated on the st lawrence opposite the city of quebec is a city of eight thousand inhabitants desjardins himself is a man of the people many years ago he became impressed with the fact that the people's savings were not utilized primarily to aid the people productively there were then located in levis branches of three ordinary banks of deposit a mutual savings bank the postal savings bank and three incorporated loaners but the people were not served after much thinking he chanced to read of the european rural banks he proceeded to work out the idea for use in levis and in nineteen hundred established there the first credit union for seven years he watched carefully the operations of this little bank the pioneer union had accumulated in that period eighty thousand dollars in resources it had made two thousand nine hundred loans to its members aggregating three hundred and fifty thousand dollars the loans averaging a hundred and twenty dollars in amount and the interest rate six and a half per cent in all this time the bank had not met with a single loss then desjardins concluded that democratic banking was applicable to canada and he proceeded to establish other credit unions in the last five years the number of credit unions in the province of quebec has grown to one hundred and twenty one and nineteen have been established in the province of ontario desjardins was not merely the pioneer all the later credit unions also have been established through his aid and twenty-four applications are now in hand requesting like assistance from him year after year that aid has been given without pay by this public-spirited man of large family and small means who lives as simply as the ordinary mechanic and it is noteworthy that this rapidly extending system of cooperative credit banks has been established in canada wholly without government aid desjardins having given his services free and his traveling expenses having been paid by those seeking his assistance in 1909 massachusetts under desjardins guidance enacted a law for the incorporation of credit unions the first union established in springfield in 1910 was named after herbert myrick a strong advocate of cooperative finance since then twenty-five other unions have been formed and the names of the unions and of their officers disclose that eleven are jewish eight french canadian and two italian 
a strong indication that the immigrant is not unprepared for financial democracy there is reason to believe that these people's banks will spread rapidly in the united states and that they will succeed for the cooperative building and loan associations managed by wage earners and salary earners who join together for systematic saving and ownership of houses have prospered in many states in massachusetts where they have existed for thirty-five years their success has been notable the number in nineteen twelve being one hundred and sixty two and their aggregate assets nearly seventy five million dollars thus farmers working men and clerks are learning to use their little capital and their savings to help one another instead of turning over their money to the great bankers for safe keeping and to be themselves exploited and may we not expect that when the cooperative movement develops in america merchants and manufacturers will learn from farmers and working men how to help themselves by helping one another and thus join in attaining the new freedom for all when merchants and manufacturers learn this lesson money kings will lose subjects and swollen fortunes may shrink but industries will flourish because the faculties of men will be liberated and developed president wilson has said wisely no country can afford to have its prosperity originated by a small controlling class the treasury of america does not lie in the brains of the small body of men now in control of the great enterprises it depends upon the inventions of unknown men upon the originations of unknown men upon the ambitions of unknown men every country is renewed out of the ranks of the unknown not out of the ranks of the already famous and powerful in control end of chapter ten recording by kathleen nelson austin texas may twenty ten end of other people's money by lewis d brandeis